Other than the high heat felt by GDDR6 on MSI's initial Evoke card, our criticism over MSI's poorly positioned and sized thermal pads also started some fires at the company. Shortly after our coverage, a few members of the MSI video card team flew out to discuss the issue of the 5700XT Evoke's thermal pads, the decisions that were made about that card, and also talk about the best way to fix it while remaining within the logistical confines of manufacturing. MSI had confirmed our testing results, but also told us that it was working on solutions. Today, we're revisiting the MSI 5700XT Evoke to see if those promises have been met. Before that, this video is brought to you by the Gigabyte Z390 Master Motherboard. If you're building a high-end gaming PC soon, consider the Z390 Master for its strong VRM for overclocking, properly finned VRM heatsink for better cooling than most, and inclusion of RGB LEDs in key areas. Learn more at the Z390 Master by Gigabyte at the link in the description below. The MSI Evoke had a number of problems, and since posting our coverage of the thermal pad issues on this card, a lot of you have emailed us about MSI thermal pad similar issues on other cards, like RTX cards and GTX cards even. But the short of it was that basically MSI used pads that on the top two memory modules on this card, there's two of them at the top and then the rest are on the side. The top two had thermal pads that were about 40% of the size of the memory module. We have footage kind of comparing the normal size versus the smaller size if you need it. And then also uh, the pads were not positioned on the center. And a couple things about GDDR6, it's a flip chip package. So it's a flip chip BGA. And that means that the actual heat source is going to be closer to the PCB than closer to the top of the module. So it'll be this direction. And additionally, that heat source is in the center of the black module on top of the PCB. So having the thermal pad off center, having no thermal pads on the back plate, which then becomes a heat trap, and also having pads that were too small meant that the MSI Evoke impressively had I'll buy a lot the worst GDDR6 thermals out of all of the 5700 XT cards that we tested when they were set to the same noise level, i.e. when controlling for the fans to make sure that the cards, we were basically testing for efficiency as opposed to brute force, we're just running the fans faster will compensate. But even on this card, running the fans faster didn't help that much originally because there's only so much what you can do when there's poor uh, thermal transfer when there's limited thermal interface between the heat sink and the heat source. So when we spoke to MSI, MSI flew out here pretty shortly after, it sounds like the whole company, all of MSI, literally all thousands of employees flew out here. Uh, I think it was three people flew out here to talk with us after our initial coverage of this. This isn't too uncommon these days, now that we're in an office, we'll get visitors when they want to talk about what, what really were the issues that we had with testing, how can they improve them, and that's a good thing because the people who visit, you have to remember, they're typically engineers or PMs or people who want to actually improve stuff. It's not like the whole company wants to make a bad product. It's that somewhere in the chain, probably management or maybe even just a factory level issue, although MSI owns the factory, so they're not able to get away from responsibility by putting it off on a factory. But somewhere in the chain, someone made the decision to do this poor thermal pad uh, approach and, and poor thermal design in general for the card, but it wasn't necessarily the engineers or PMs, and those are the ones who visit us. And what they told us was that the fix is to add thermal pads to the back plate. We're gonna show some of that footage, and thermal pads to the front of the card that are more centered. Uh, they did not increase the size of the thermal pads on the front, but they centered them properly on the modules. That helped a lot, and then the pads on the back plate helped a lot, because again, it's, it's uh, flip chip BGA, and a backplate with no connection to the PCB becomes a heat trap because the air can't get out and it's just burning up in there. So, uh, so those things were the attempted solutions. And if you want to get yours fixed, if you bought one of the originals, MSI is offering an RMA program. They should not really charge you anything. You, I don't know, you might pay for shipping one way, but hopefully not. But they're offering an RMA program where you can get the pads replaced by MSI. I don't think they're sending them out to you to replace yourself, but I actually don't disagree with that decision as much as I, I would like to, but in our assembling and disassembling of this card, the biggest issue has been getting junction temperature to back where it started before disassembly. Something about this specific card, there's a mounting pressure issue if it's reassembled in really any way except for one specific one. So we think it's okay that they're requiring that the MSI team do the reassembly and, and disassembly for this one. But anyway, 
we should probably get into, let's get into the just the thermal results and get that all out of the way first. And then we'll talk about the visible differences, the teardown between the two cards to show the thermal pad changes after the thermal results. And we'll talk about some of the testing parameters we had for this after as well. Here's the table that matters most. This is with a single fan speed set across all of the configurations, putting out 40 dBA at 20 inches away and spinning at 1730 RPM. We ensured the BIOS was also set the same to the 200 watt power budget for all tests and we used the same vBIOS for all of the tests unless marked otherwise. The original result had the MSI Evoke at 95 degrees Celsius, which is approaching the maximum junction temperature for memory, at least for G6. GDDR6 should be about 100 to 105 degrees Celsius for TJ Maxx. From what we understand, 95 degrees Celsius means that it easily reached TJ Maxx inside of a case where internal ambient can range from 30 to 40 degrees in a room of 21 to maybe 25 degrees Celsius, depending on your case. We're testing in a 21 degrees Celsius environment without a case, so it really wouldn't take much to push this number into territory of maximum values. And even if not, it's still just comparatively bad cooling versus everyone else, which is what really mattered here. The revision at the same fan speed and power budget ran at 87 degrees Celsius, which is significantly improved. A temperature reduction of about 7.6 degrees from MSI's change is huge because MSI didn't even change other design flaws of the cooler, like whatever mounting pressure issue is preventing them from using full-sized pads and the same mounting issue that causes some of the high junction temperatures when reassembling. If you already have an Evoke, it's probably worth sending it in under RMA to get these pads replaced or added. We decided to next swap the new cooler onto the old PCB. This decision was made because the new cooler should be representative of what MSI is now selling, but the old cooler we had, other than the thermal pads, did have some other small changes, and it was also technically a review sample that might have been pre-production. So we moved the new cooler to the old card. The memory choice should likely be based upon supply, so Samsung Micron, that will probably vary card to card but uh, other things will be fixed changes further. We can't really say that they've fixed the issue with as many variables as we had, so we eliminated the PCB, GPU, and memory variables with a board swap. The result was 88 degree GDDR6 thermals, which is about in line with the previous test and still improved. None of these are as good as our own MSI Evoke mod, where we used full-size thermal pads, we used washers to increase the screw tension, and also used high quality thermal pads, but MSI is at least in sort of acceptable but not great territory, as opposed to the previous totally unacceptable territory. Our version was a lot better at 80 degrees, but it also had flaws. We were concerned about the washer mod potentially being risky for users, as it has the increased risk of cracking the silicon when using washers because too much force could be applied. And again, we did use more expensive thermal pads for that as well. As for stock results, we have a chart for that as well. This is without manual fan control, so the fan speeds are now doing whatever vBIOS asks for. It looks like the old vBIOS is running at a louder 2330 RPM, with the revision running at 2200 RPM. Part of MSI's improved performance is from the higher fan speed in the newer vBIOS, which is also why we set the same vBIOS and fan speed and v, uh, power budget and all of the 40 dBA normalized tests earlier. Either way, if you use the card out of the box or out of the box thermals, it'll be a bit louder than the first public release vBIOS, but about 100 RPM lower than the initial reviewer vBIOS. The stock noise level in our test platform is 46.7 dBA with the newest card with a noise floor of about 26 dB. The vBIOS sets a 2200 RPM fan speed to meet the temperature target, which appears to be about 63 degrees edge. That means that if you're in a hotter case, it will increase the fan speed to try and maintain 63. That's louder than it should be, really. MSI was probably trying to overcompensate for its previous issues. GDR6 thermals here are good, at least, with an 80 degree reading for the revision under its new 2200 RPM fan speed. And they're not as bad when with a lowered fan speed as they were originally. If we look at the auto results for GPU thermals, you'll see that the Evoke runs at 80 degrees junction for the revision or 84 to 86 for the original tests. The good news is that the thermal headroom afforded by the revision means that you could tune the fan curve back down a little bit to be quieter without completely killing the thermal performance. Again, unlike previously, you really didn't have any room to do that originally. Finally, as for the 40 dBA normalized GPU results, those don't really change, which makes sense. We're, we're not really influencing the GPU. The revisions results are the same as the original, which is mostly unsurprising, as the changes primarily target 
memory thermals, VRM thermals to an extent with the backplate changes. Our initial mod did better in GPU thermals from the increased mounting pressure mostly, but we had some heavier duty thermal pads on there too, and that is sort of near the GPU ultimately. When we swapped the cooler, the GPU junction thermals ran hot no matter how many times we swapped it, and that seemed to be a mounting pressure issue on the GPU specifically. Washers would probably fix this, but to be fair, we are swapping a much newer cooler onto an original review sample, which could be pre-production or could be first production run, and it's not a perfect fit. So you can kind of ignore these GPU thermals because it's not really a real use case anyway. But G6 was our primary focus and we already covered those. All right, let's talk about the changes they made now that we've seen the thermal differences. So what constitutes those results, those deltas? First of all, the memory has changed, but that might not be intentional. Uh, these memory suppliers typically change a bit depending on the memory supply, the availability. So if MSI couldn't get memory from supplier A, they might have switched to B temporarily, but they could switch back. And uh, previously, it was Micron memory, and on the newest card we got it was Samsung, hence why we switched the cooler between the models just to kind of validate that that wasn't a factor to consider. But that's a change that's worth noting. It might not be the same for your card. Suppliers change all the time. The backplate, this, it wasn't like this before. Previously, the backplate had nothing on it for thermal pads. It was blank. And they've added a few bumpers, rubber bumpers to the edges, which is fine. The thermal pads, though, were added in the memory area. They make full contact for the most part. One of the things in talking with MSI, they were able to validate our testing results. And in trying to find a solution for this, MSI noticed that having the thermal pad in case, like kind of spill over the edge of the module on the PCB was helpful for thermals, but they weren't able for other reasons to do that in the design. I'll talk about that more in a moment. The backplate though, so there's pads added for the VRM, pads added for the memory, and then interestingly, if you peel back one of these thermal pads, you'll see that the, the plastic sheath here that protects the back of the card from shorting like the, the through hole components to the back plate, that protective layering is still underneath the thermal pads. So there's things MSI can still improve on. It absolutely works way better than it did before. Just as a small note though, like tiny things to improve on that maybe could add another degree of improvement. I don't know, I haven't validated it. It's not really worth validating uh, at this point. They've done well enough. But MSI could cut out the hole uh, for the thermal pad so that it makes direct contact to the actual aluminum, like to the metal the thing that sinks the heat. So small stuff like that could be further improved. The biggest challenge here though, is that MSI is working with a production run where they've already got all of the tools made, whatever's being done on the, the punch line, it's all made, everything's working. It's not really fast to change tooling for stuff. It could take months. So MSI is trying to figure out how do we fix this problem without retooling a video card? Because by the time they're done retooling it, the 5700 XT is going to no longer really be selling at the pace it is today. So that's the challenge. Backplate's definitely improved. The front side of the card, most of the pads are on here, it's still got some small pads, as you can see. There's actually, they've added in a, like a little carriage, a punch out <laughs> around the memory modules. So the pads are positioned on the center of those punch outs now for the top ones, and then at the border for the side ones. That wasn't there on the original heat sink. It's just a guidance thing for the people doing the hand placement of the thermal pads. And they are centered, which is really what a lot of the improvement comes from other than the back plate. But MSI told us that the PMs were saying they'd rather have had full size thermal pads that do slightly spill over the edge of the module or at least cover the whole top of it. But for some reason, we're not a, still not 100% clear on they weren't able to do that. And it sounded like it was a mounting pressure issue, but I, there's a lot of reasons I, I, I'm not sure if I can say I disagree because I don't know that I understand, but it sounded like MSI was claiming that these memory modules at the top were much closer to the GPU package than they had expected when they originally designed the card. And that once they, uh, I guess once AMD provided the specs and the reference boards, MSI was not prepared for how close they were to the GPU. And so some reason claims that a thermal pad that covers the entirety of the bottom side of the memory modules for the top would cause a fitment issue or clearance issue. But you then look at their RTX and GTX designs where they've cut the same corner and they're doing the same thing even though the memory is spaced differently. So not really sure that I agree, 
but I'm also not sure that I fully understand what they were talking about. And I don't really know that that necessarily the people we spoke with do either. It, it, this seems like maybe something more of a factory level issue. So the issue is being communicated from someone at a factory, which MSI does own, and then through someone probably in management, through a PM, through PR, and then to us. So who the hell knows what the original statement was, but that's what we were told. At the end of the day though, they've improved it to the extent that is possible without fully retooling the card. Uh, and I guess that's, that's all you can really ask. So uh, finally, testing. So for testing we did today, all the numbers have been reported already, but let's just go over some of the quick numbers here. To do A versus B properly, we did have to transplant the cooler and there are some issues with that too, but we talked about that already. And then to do A versus B properly, you also have to fix the RPM. We tested on the, the new card, new cooler together without disassembly first to the extent that we could, and then we disassembled and swapped it later. So fixed RPM matters. Uh, typing in a fan speed percentage is not good enough to control the RPM with these cards. Each one, the PWM signal will behave a little bit differently. So 38% on one card might not be 1730 on the other card. It might be like 1700 RPM or 1800 RPM. So you, we have to manually look at it. We check the, I was checking the fan speed with a physical tachometer, like a, a laser pointed at the fan to make sure it's accurate. Test at the same ambient, monitor the ambient every single second of the test, and then uh, adjust if, if necessary. Keep it at 21 degrees Celsius for that. Same VBIOS for all of these, that's important too. Same power budget and VBIOS for all of them. So nothing was changed except for the coolers, basically. And then we did have tests with the two different PCBs, but then also swapped for that. So uh, the conclusion, should you buy one of these today with the fixes? Well, first of all, the old stock might not be cleared out. So you might get one of the ones that we reviewed originally, if it's still on the shelves. And MSI is offering to do the replacement for you if you send it in. That's a time hassle, obviously. But it's a service that they're offering for whatever that's worth. Uh, it's certainly, MSI seems to be taking this the right way and doing the right things to try and fix it. It's just that they also couldn't fix it to the fullest satisfaction of, of it sounds like some of their engineers or us. But it's, it's one of those like good enough fixes. Would I buy it uh, or would we recommend buying it? Well, there's a lot of very good 5700 XT cards out there right now and there are other reasons we would buy those cards before this one anyway, like the PCB quality, the lack of dual BIOS, things of that nature, unless you really like the color, I was gonna say the color, but that's a subjective thing. So really it's just PCB quality, lack of VBIOS, dual VBIOS are the main reasons we wouldn't buy it anyway. But now at least we can say if it's the only card in your region or you're buying it secondhand or something, it's not terrible with these fixes. It's, it's, it's out of unacceptable territory and into kind of okay territory. And that's the biggest improvement it looks like they can make. We commend MSI for making the improvement because they could have just as easily ignored us and everyone else and just kept rolling forward because we're kind of, at the end of the day, against millions of components that they make per month. Millions of motherboards and video cards out of one MSI factory in a month. We're not really meaningful to that, that greater scale of things the impact we have. So it's cool that they listened. There could be more done. We still wouldn't really buy the card, but it's okay now if you do have to buy it. And that's it for this one. Thank you for watching. Subscribe for more. Go to store.gamersaccess.net to help us out directly, like by buying one of our GPU teardown kits or one of our mod mats or shirts. And you can go to patreon.com slash gamersaccess for behind the scenes videos. We'll see you all next time.